going to talk about um, nematodes, and I'm going to go over some general characteristics of nematodes and what they are and how they work, uh, you know, how they live in the, in the environment and things like that. And then we'll get more specifically into pine wilt nematode, um, a little bit about their biology, and uh, then we'll go into some control for those. So I'll get started here, and we're going to talk about phylum Phylum, uh, phylum nematoda. Okay, where am I at? Okay. Thank you for bearing with me today. Uh, nematodes. Uh, basically, nematodes are animals. They are not an arthropod. They're not in the insects. The entomologists do not claim them at all. And so these guys are actually the most numerous animal that we have in the world. If you were to actually go look at uh, a plot of land, um, you know, usually you, you can find about a billion nematodes in an acre. And these are all sorts of nematodes. These are uh, composting nematodes, you know, bacterial feeders, things like that that are just, you know, in the soil. They're breaking down uh, organic matter and not really doing much of anything at all. Nematodes are non-segmented roundworms, that's what we call them, although they are not a true worm. So have somebody that says, oh, I have nematodes in my soil. Uh, no, they've got worms, because if they were able to see uh, nematodes, you need a microscope for those. And the only time you would, not, you would be able to see a nematode are some of the um, humid pathogen nematodes that you might find in the tropics that grow to fairly large. But here in the United States, our nematodes are microscopic. You would not be able to see them with the naked eye. And because they are animals, they have some of the same systems that humans do, actually. They have a nervous system. They have muscles, a reproductive system. They have excretory and digestive systems. The only thing that they don't have are um, circulatory or, and they don't breathe like uh, normal animals, like you would think animals do. They are considered an invertebrate, and they are cold-blooded, so they adapt to the temperature around them. They do need oxygen. So if you have an anaerobic or uh, a situation where there is no oxygen, then uh, these uh, animals will not survive. They are covered by a cuticle, which means that they do need to molt that cuticle in order to grow. And we'll talk about their life cycle here in just a bit. And they have that uh, caterpillar, that snake-like movement, you know, that kind of moves um, through the soil. And that's kind of how they get around as well. Um, nematodes are approximately uh, 0 0.05 to 0 0.2 millimeters long, which means that they're really, really, really teeny. And like I said, unless you're living in the tropics, you're not going to be able to see nematodes without a microscope, um, very good uh, uh, hand lens, if you will. Uh, you just won't be able to see them. And these guys actually, they move through the soil in a film of water, but they don't move very far. I mean, they, they don't swim per se. So if you are using flood irrigation or uh, a lot of water on a, on a golf course, for example, then you might see these nematodes move just a little bit through the soil and um, start causing problems. If you have uh, sandy soils, then chances are you will have a, a little bit larger nematodes because they can get a little bit bigger. The sandy soils have more pore space in them, and so the nematodes are e it's easier for the nematodes to get through those. If you have clay soils like we do here in Colorado, um, our nematodes are going to be pretty tiny because um, the clay soils there's not a lot of uh, pore space in those, and so the nematodes don't easily move uh, throughout that clay soil. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they do live in uh, soil. They are also, um, they're also marine sediment nematodes, so they like uh, salt water. They, there are animal parasites, and not, you know, we think of like um, dogs and cats and things like that, but also human uh, parasites. And there are plant parasites, but not very many of them. Only about 10% of the total species of uh, nematodes tend to be plant parasites. And in warmer climates, nematodes 
are more of a problem than they are in the northern climates, mostly because, of course, it's warmer, and the nematodes are cold-blooded organisms, so they actually survive a little bit better. If you live in the southeastern part of the United States, chances are you are fairly familiar with uh, nematode problems because they do have more problems with nematodes down in the southeastern part than we do actually out in the west. And there are uh, various nematodes that feed on various different plant parts. So for example, we have what we call root feeding nematodes or um, foliar nematodes. We have uh, seed nematodes and things like that. So when we talk about foliar feeders, those are the ones that get into the uh, leaf tissue of a plant. We also have stem and bulb nematodes, things that uh, get into, uh, nematodes that get into, say, like onions or um, garlic uh, bulbs. And the seed galls, these would be things like uh, the anguina species that get into uh, grasses. And what they do is the nematodes develop in the developing seed of the plant and thereby take the place of the seed and um, cause major problems for export if you're trying to export seed and you uh, have a problem with that particular one. The root feeding nematodes, these are generally uh, cyst nematodes, although not always, but you know things like um, potato cyst nematode or sugar beet cyst nematode, things like that. Um, there are also some other um, root nematodes that affect things, um, Pratolinca species that affect alfalfa, uh, so on and so forth. Now the picture on your right, these are uh, lance nematodes that are feeding on a plant root, um, and I don't know exactly which plant that is, but I'm going to suspect it's a turf grass. So um, you can see the nematodes here, uh, these are stained red, and you can see how small they really are. Uh, they're uh, very tiny and you know, this is like a 200 times magnification of these particular nematodes. So it is, they are quite small and very difficult to see. And how these nematodes get around, um, like they, like I said, they can get around in a, a film of water. Uh, usually this film of water will allow them to move maybe about uh, a meter a year. They're not going to go very far. And if um, you either flood soils or dry, or you have an anaerobic condition. The um, that anaerobic condition is going to actually kill the nematodes because they do need oxygen. Remember, they are an aerobic organism, so they need oxygen. And anything that moves soil will move nematodes. So if you think about tractor tires, even your shoes. Uh, wind-blown particles, so if you're, uh, you know, digging up soil matter and there's nematodes in there, uh, sometimes the eggs or the actual nematodes can be attached to these soil particles and get blown around. They can also move through irrigation water. Uh, ducks, you know, if you think about ducks or geese on a, on a golf course, if the nematodes are ponding at the surface of the uh, turf, then they can, uh, the nematodes can hitch a ride on, on ducks' feet and kind of move around that way. Now these nematodes can also uh, survive in the egg stage as a dormant nematode, uh, although sometimes the larvae can be the survival stage. They have a, um, a particular way of surviving. It's, um, and now I've just lost the, the term I was thinking of, uh, but these, they can actually go into a dormant phase and survive for quite a number of years. Now, uh, up here on the top right uh, is a picture of a uh, Coleoptera larvae, a beetle larvae that has been colonized with uh, entomopathogenic nematodes, and you can actually see the nematodes as they are inside this particular grub, and it's colonizing and feeding on this grub and will eventually kill it. So. Uh, it makes a very good biocontrol for some of the coleopteran uh, insects uh, as grubs. You can see those up there. And like I said, um, nematodes, they can be plant feeders. They can be uh, omnivores. They can uh, be fungal feeders, meaning that they feed on different uh, fungi around. They can actually be predators, which is the picture in the right. They are a predator of other insects. They can be bacterial feeders, which is breaking down organic matter in the soil. And 
truly, since only about 10% of the total nematodes are plant pathogens, most of these guys are really beneficial. Um, they do break down the organic matter, they're recycling nutrients in the soil, and, you know, if you have a lot of nematodes in your soil community, chances are you have a pretty healthy, biodiverse soil complex. So, um, you know, because these guys are just, they're breaking down, like I say, they're breaking down organic matter and they are recycling nutrients. So they are, for the most part, beneficial, but, you know, there are the few bad actors out there, and so we'll get to those in just a minute. So the generalized life cycle um, for a nematode is usually about two to four weeks. And basically what it is is you have an egg, uh, you have four juvenile stages, and then uh, after the last molt of the juvenile, it becomes either a male or a female nematode, um, just depending on the hormones that are being produced. So um, a lot of times the females will uh, produce eggs. Um, and does not need the male nematode to fertilize those. And the female nematode can actually lay hundreds of eggs and so actually build up populations fairly quickly. And the next slide, this slide, is a depiction, just kind of this overall illustration of what happens. So you have the egg up here, and this picture on the right is actually an egg of the nematode. And you can kind of see the outline of the nematode in there, and here is the stylet of a plant pathogenic nematode. So when uh, you have the egg here, you actually have the first juvenile stage inside that egg. When that juvenile hatches out of the egg, this is considered the J2 stage, so the juvenile, the second juvenile stage. And then it goes to your third juvenile stage and the fourth juvenile stage. And then at the fourth juvenile stage, then um, it becomes either the adult male or the adult female. And these, uh, this picture of the eggs is actually a soybean cyst nematodes. So if you are uh, anywhere in uh, the Midwest, you know, like uh, a huge soybean producing area like Iowa, um, they do a lot of soybean cyst nematode testing uh, because they do have large populations there. Um, Nematodes can survive on uh, perennial, perennial hosts. Uh, a lot of nematodes have a pretty broad host range, so they're not going to be specific to one particular plant. Other, and there are exceptions to every rule, of course, and so we'll talk about that with the pine wilt nematode. Nematodes can also survive in infected plant parts, so if you have a plant that has been diagnosed with a nematode problem, uh, chances are the best bet is to just get it out of there. And so uh, otherwise, even in a compost pile, uh, if you were to put these infected plants into a compost pile, chances of those nematodes surviving are actually pretty good. Um, you know, you have moist conditions, it's actually fairly warm, and chances are the compost pile may not get hot enough to kill the nematodes. Nematodes can also survive as eggs in the soil. Um, even though eggs um, can desiccate or, you know, they might be uh, fed upon by other predators, they can still be protected in cysts or in the dead female body. So sometimes they can. They also survive by going into a low metabolic state called cryptobiosis, and they can survive for a number of years in this particular state. In fact, um, Seed gall nematodes can do this uh, very readily. Here, you know, I do the, our uh, prep for our basic plant pathology lab, and we have, I have some seed that has, that is infected with, or infested with um, anguina nematodes. And I don't think I can find them now, but the seed was about, it's probably about 20 years now, 20 years old now, but about 10 years ago, we were still able to get live nematodes out of some of those seed galls. So again, you know, they can survive for a number of years in that particular state. Now, plant pathogenic nematodes, like I said, they're only about 10% of all of the nematodes are plant parasites. And these guys are what we consider obligate parasites, meaning that they need a live host to live in. Um, 
plant pathogenic nematodes also have a structure that is very unique to, to them. They have what is called a stylet. And this picture right here shows the stylet, um, this elongated needle-like uh, structure coming out of the head of the nematode. The head of the nematode is right here. This is the stylet that it is projecting out. And at the end of the stylet is what are called stylet bulbs. And those stylet bulbs actually help push that stylet in and out. And so what the nematode does is it takes that stylet, it punctures the plant cell, and as it punctures that cell, it pushes in digestive enzymes that kind of digest, pre-digest those cell contents, and then the nematode can suck that out. And sometimes you'll have, we'll have nematodes like cyst nematodes that will inject other compounds um, and uh, enzymes and toxins that actually uh, degrade cell walls so that uh, the plant cells become these giant nurse cells or um, uh, syncytiums is, is one of the other terms for it, but they become these big nurse cells. And these are uh, mostly uh, confined to the cyst nematodes because they need that huge uh, feeding cell in order to sustain life and to actually produce the eggs. So it's, I mean, these guys, they, they do, they have a lot of uh, techniques that they use to infect plants and, it, and it, um, it's quite amazing to, to watch them. Um, different parts of the plants the nematodes can affect, you know, I mentioned this earlier, they have the floral uh, parts where they affect the flowers and the seeds, uh, foliars where they get into the leaves, uh, the stem and bulb, stem and bulb nematodes, which they will affect the stems and petioles and bulbs like onion and garlic, things like that. Uh, they, there are also some that live in the wood of declining or dead trees, and these would be things like the pine wilt nematode. And then there's the root nematodes, which are the largest group. And so, um, you know, if you are familiar with any type of cropping situation, like um, cyst nematodes are probably one of the uh, major problems in uh, soybean growing areas and things like that. Now, some of the symptoms that nematodes can cause. Um, these are kind of interesting. You might see some uh, stunting of plants or yellowing. In the lower left picture here are tomatoes that are being affected by uh, root knot nematode on tomato. And you can see the yellowing, the wilting of the plants. They're, they're stunted. Uh, some of these uh, root nematodes can cause galling on the roots. So, for example, this carrot picture right here in the bottom right is actually um, – a root nematode that affects the root knot nematode that is um, causing galling on the carrot root. So, and I've had some samples come uh, into the clinic of this and that you can actually cut these galls off and just put them in a petri dish of water and you can watch the nematodes swim out of there. It's really kind of cool to see those things, but um, it's not so good for the grower, uh, unfortunately, but you know, for a plant pathologist, it's, it's kind of interesting. And you can also see uh, this is a golf course here in the upper uh, middle picture or the upper left picture, I should say. And you can see the, the damage that a nematode, uh, nematodes are causing on the turf, you know, with the yellowing of the grass, things like this. And you can see what we call this aggregated distribution uh, because they're not going to go very far. It's very limited uh, into, in this area. And... Um, you know, so if you were to look in this area, uh, you would see the nematodes, and this would be the only area that you would need to treat as well. So you wouldn't have to, you know, put out a, a nematicide or some sort of treatment uh, all over the golf course. You, know, you could just use this uh, very localized treatment in this particular area. The upper right picture also shows these uh, root nematodes, root knot nematodes, and root feeding nematodes causing what we say root pruning. Uh, meaning that they're feeding on the roots, and so the roots are just not growing. They've actually, they're very stubby and uh, very, very distinct on some of these uh, particular plants. Um, again, aggregated distribution, meaning that it's not going to be widespread throughout the entire planting. So what you're looking at here in this left picture with the tomato uh, root knot nematode, it's just confined, confined to these three or four plants here, and so it's um, 
you know, very, very limited. So pulling the plants out, uh, maybe treating the soil or, uh, you know, rotating out of tomatoes for a few years might be the best way to uh, manage that particular problem. And again, uh, the right hand picture here is the golf course and, um, you know, like I say, treatment limited for that particular area. It doesn't have to be the whole golf course. Now, if you're going to sample for nematodes, um, what you want to do is take a composite sample. And so uh, you want to sample in different locations, especially if you're not certain where your populations would be. Now, for looking at trees, and I'll talk about that when we get to diagnostics for pine wilt nematode, but uh, for soil nematodes, soil borne nematodes, this is the best way to do it. Um, so you'd want to kind of do this uh, zigzag pattern where you're taking uh, random, you know, uh, a certain amount of soil out of the plot in a zigzag pattern. So you're kind of covering the um, entire field. And you also want to, if you suspect you have nematodes, you know, figure out when the populations are going to be really high so that you know when you sample you're going to have good results and, and be able to see nematodes and to be able to identify them. So um, again, you know, this is for soil borne and I'll talk about how to sample for uh, pine wilt nematode. Um, when we talk about, um, an, um, you know, how much damage do some of these nematodes do, basically what you're looking at is um, an, an economic damage threshold. So, and this is, uh, it's based on the population of the nematode, it's based in the populate, you know, in the plants and how you're measuring these nematodes if, you, if you're doing a number count, things like this. Um, there's a lot of other factors involved as far as like, you know, what type of turf grass it is, is there any control for it, um, different things like that. But if you're looking specifically at economic damage thresholds, and this is just a guideline, um, if you think that you have um, dagger nematodes and you're counting 200 nematodes per 100 cubic centimeters of soil, then this might be the time that you want to start treating is because once populations get above those that particular number, then the damage to the turf grass is going to be greater and it may be harder to control. So again, you know, just looking at economic thresholds and, um, you know, determining. And there may be times when the populations of the nematodes don't get above, you know, 50 or 60. And so you may never need to control if you're looking at soil-borne uh, nematodes. So moving into uh, pinewood nematode. Pinewood nematode is uh, Bursafalinca xylophilus. Uh, it is native to North America, and it is a fungivore, which means that when we are finding Bursafalinca's in trees uh, in the wood, there's usually some blue stain fungi because these nematodes will feed on that blue stain. Now, that being said, we don't always see the blue stain fungi. So it's not necessarily a diagnostic tool to use that blue stain fungi as um, a, a good indicator that you have pine wilt nematode. Sometimes we'll find pine wilt nematode without it. One of the characteristic identification features for pine wilt nematode is this structure right here. This is called the spicule. And they all have a very pointed tail and the males are the ones that have the spicule. So if all we're getting out of the wood are nematodes and they're females, we're not going to see this structure. And so I'll talk about another tool that we use to identify these particular nematodes. But another problem with identifying the Bursafalinca xylophilus only on the uh, physical characteristics of the nematode is that there are other species of Bursafalinca out there. There's Bursafalinca mucronatus, which does not cause pine wilt um, disease, um, but it can be found in some plants as well. And so, um, knowing the uh, the morphological characteristics of the nematode is is important, but sometimes it's kind of hard to identify them. And so we have the the molecular tools now to be able to identify these guys. 
Now, pinewood nematode will cause uh, lethal wilt uh, in exotic pines. And specifically, scotch pines is when it was first found and first discovered in the US. Uh, scotch pine is not a native pine to the United States. And so um, a lot of uh, plantings, Dr. Tisserat did a lot of work on scotch pine and pine wilt nematode in Kansas when he was at Kansas State University. And so now we are actually finding it in Austrian pines as well here in Colorado. We're not finding it in ponderosa pines. I have not ever recovered pinewood nematode out of ponderosa pine. Now there are some nematodes in ponderosa pines, but they are not Bursephalinchus xylophilus. Um, I believe we have found a Bursephalinchus mucronatus, but it is not devastating to ponderosa pines. Now, how these uh, nematodes get around is really quite ingenious. Um, the pine wood uh, nematode is moved around by pine sawyer beetles. So what happens is that if the tree is uh, infected with pine wood uh, nematode, the pine sawyer actually feeds at the base of needles and starts feeding and it can actually drop those pine wilt nematodes, it can drop the Bursephalinchus nematodes, but it can also pick it up. And the nematodes get into the spiracles of the beetle. And so it's, um, you know, kind of clogging, not really clogging up, but it's the, the spiracles are the ventilation system of the insect. And so the nematodes are actually hitching a ride. And then when the pine sawyer is feeding at the base of the needles, the nematodes hop off and, you know, then they go down into the tree um, and they get into the uh, rosin canals of the plant. So it's really quite ingenious. And when these nematodes get into the rosin canals, basically what they're doing is they're blocking the vascular system. So they're blocking the tracheids. There is no resin production. In Scott's pine, uh, if I get a scotch pine sample into the clinic and it still has rosin production, then I know that it does not have pine wilt nematode because the pine wilt nematode will colonize the scotch pine very quickly, block the tracheids, and it will make that uh, wood very dry and very brittle. Now, that being said, the Austrian pines will still have a little bit of rosin production. I have been able to recover the Bursafalinca xylophilus out of the um, Austrian pines that are still producing a little bit of rosin. So the question then becomes is, well, what's happening in Austrian pines that they're still producing this rosin? And I'm thinking, and there's been some discussion between some of the arborists here in Colorado and Dr. Tisserat and myself on the fact that maybe the Austrians might be just a tad more resistant than the scotch pines and the nematodes are not able to colonize the tracheids and the rosin canals as quickly as they do in the scotch pines. In, um, when Dr. Tisserat was doing his research uh, on this particular organism in Kansas, what he was seeing on the scotch pines was that the trees would start to fade about the 1st of August. By the end of August, they would be completely gone. So you would start seeing um, that browning of the needles, you would start seeing decline of the needles, and then within about 30 days, <coughs> within about 30 days, excuse me, that tree would be totally gone. We are not seeing that with the Austrian pines. Austrian pines, it seems to be a very slow decline, and I think that has to do with the replication of the nematodes inside the rosin canals and the tracheids. It's just not as, they're not colonizing as quickly as they do in the scotch pines. So, um, that being said, those are just a little bit of the differences that I'm seeing between Scotch and Austrian pines when uh, we get samples into the clinic. So here's the, here's the really good slide on how the nematodes are getting into the tree. So you have pine sawyer beetles that have the nematode. And so the nematodes leave the beetle, they enter the feeding wounds at the base of the needles here uh, where the pine sawyer is feeding. The nematodes, um, 
if they're in a resistant host, because pine sawyers will feed on ponderosa pines and, and other declining trees as well, um, if, it's not, if the tree's not a host for the Bercephalinchus xylophilus, then the nematodes will just die. If they happen to get into a uh, host tree, like scotch pines or austrians, then what happens is they will start multiplying in the rosin canals in the tracheids and uh, will start that process of replication and declining trees. So the adult Sawyer beetle will also lay their eggs on de dying and declining trees because that's what pine Sawyers do. They are attracted to stressed and dying trees. And so then you also have uh, bark beetles that are attracted to these dying trees and they will transmit the blue stain fungi that the nematodes will feed on. So the um, nematodes will, you know, the Sawyer uh, beetles will, um, you know, the eggs will hatch, they will, the larvae will develop inside the wood, um, and then the nematodes are, uh, once the Sawyer beetles start to go into the pupal state, the nematodes are attracted to the Sawyer beetles and so then colonize the spiracles and go on. So I may, I think I misspoke before when I was talking about the whole life cycle. So um, this slide is the one that you really want to focus on if you're looking at the life cycle. Um, the nematodes that are in the wood will feed on the fungi that has been transmitted by uh, the bark beetles. And so, and then the nematodes will go into the, um, uh, the pupa uh, before the adult Sawyer emerges. So once the adult Sawyers emerge, then um, they're full of nematodes and ready to um, transmit them. And so they can go all over the place. So again, you know, this is the, the life cycle and this is a really excellent um, illustration of how this can, uh, how this happens with a pine wood nematode and the Sawyer beetles and the bark beetles and, and how it all combines to um, cause pine wilt disease and the eventual uh, death of the tree. So it's really a, a, a good slide to take away from that. And these are just some pictures. Um, the lower right hand side is a scotch pine that is declining. It's like probably early to mid decline. <laughs> Excuse me. The middle picture here on the bottom is the blue stain fungi that is um, in the wood that has been uh, moved in by the bark beetles. The lower left is you can see the sawdust like frass associated with the uh, pine sawyer uh, feeding moving through the wood. Uh, this middle picture here on the left side, uh, left middle here, this is a pine sawyer emerging from the hole, uh, from their exit hole. Uh, this top picture up here, you can see the exit hole of the pine sawyer beetle. You can see the, it's a huge hole. Um, the beetles, they're considered longhorn beetles and um, quite large. And so they are exiting out of there. And this top picture, again, is another um, pine sawyer uh, beetle uh, associated with the trees. So how do we diagnose these nematodes? Well. The above ground nematodes, you can look at them with a dissecting scope. If you're looking for soil, uh, if you're looking for nematodes in soil and plant roots, then, you know, there are several ways that we do this. You know, you can do soil extractions, you can do plant root extractions, um, different things like this. Now, how we diagnose um, Bercephalinchus nematodes in particular is one of the ways is to do a bubbling method. So. Uh, for sampling, for a sample of wood for pine wilt nematode testing, we need about a 12 inch length of at least two inch diameter wood from the area closest to the trunk out on the branch. So if you're cutting down a tree and you want to identify this, and, the, and it's important to make sure that you um, send in the sample as soon as possible after the tree has declined or has died. I mean, if the tree's been dead for a year or two, there's no way we're going to find any nematodes in there. But if it's been, you know, two or three months, chances are we'll still be able to find some nematodes in that tree. So um, the, the time frame is um, uh, pretty, uh, 
I, I don't want to say limited because it is still kind of extensive, but it's still, you know, there is a, a time frame associated with finding these particular nematodes. And so, you know, I get this, uh, you know, 12 inch length of wood from closest to the trunk and then what I do is I cut little half inch cookies, um, you know, about three or four, you know, a couple off of each end of it and then I prune, uh, cut those up into ch little chunks, uh, put them in a glass beaker with um, distilled water and a little uh, air hose off of a pump and aerate that for about 24 hours. And what that aeration does is it injects oxygen into the system. Remember, nematodes are aerobes and they need oxygen. So it injects oxygen into the water so that the nematodes will stay alive, but it also helps them float out of those wood chips. And so then we can use um, uh, a sieve system. We have some strainers to sieve out the big chunks and keep the nematodes, uh, put it into a glass petri dish, and then we start looking for little swimming nematodes under the dissecting scope. Now again, we can use microscopy looking for the spicule on the males. Also uh, another characteristic for these is that they're actually fairly long nematodes. Um, for a nematode. They're, they're more along the, you know, one centimeter to two centimeters length. And they also have a very pointed tail uh, down here. But again, if they don't have the spicule that we can look for, then we go to our newest tool, which is a, a loop-mediated isothermal amplification. And basically what this is, is this is a molecular PCR in a tube, and poly, uh, PCR is polymerase chain reaction, and we use this sometimes for diagnostics when we're not able to actually morphologically identify um, some of the problems. So what we uh, purchased here in the clinic is we have this kit, I have this lamp kit, and it actually has very specific primers for Bursafalinkus xylophilus. So, if I'm extracting Bursafalinkus mucronatus, then it will not be um, amplified. The, the DNA out of the Bursafalinkus mucronatus will not be amplified. And it's really cool because everything happens in this really, this um, 0.5 millimeter uh, little tube and you have a control which is this plasma DNA. Um, shown here, and this is basically your positive control. Uh, you have a sample here that has Bursafalinka xylophilus, and you can see the color of it matches the uh, positive control. <coughs> Excuse me. This uh, third tube here is a Bursafalinka mucronatus, and you can see it did not uh, amplify, it did not turn the same color as the xylophilus, so you know that you're using are very specific and then you have a negative control which means that you didn't put any DNA in there you actually just add some water uh, in there and so you can see and what you do is you put this under UV light and you look at the um, um, how it uh, you know basically shines back at you if it lights up like these green uh, tubes right here then it's positive for pine wilt nematode the Bursafalinka xylophilus. And if it doesn't um, uh, illuminate like these two, then it is negative. And this kit actually was developed uh, in Japan. It's by the Nippon Gene Company. It's really expensive though. And I will tell you that uh, the one kit that I bought was has 96 reactions in it. Um, and that doesn't include, or that includes the positive controls but it has 96 reactions and the kit was like $1,500. So it wasn't cheap at all to purchase. But the nice thing about it is, is that it gives me a positive uh, or negative result using this new technology, this um, basically PCR in a tube. And it's, since it's so specific to Bursafalinka xylophilus and that's the only organism that it will uh, amplify, uh, the DNA from, then it works really well. So what I usually do for um, nematode diagnostics is I get my wood chips and I bubble those. If I find nematodes in there, 
then I will process that sample again using the lamp just to verify that it is Bursafalinca xylophilus. If I see no nematodes, then I'm not using a, um, a lamp test for something that's not there. So it takes a little bit of time to do this, but I would rather be positive in my identification than just say, I'm 95% sure that it's Bursafalinca xylophilus, but um, just by the morphological characteristics, but now I can be 100% sure using the LAMP procedure. Um, so this is really awesome. So this is how um, we diagnose the um, uh, nematodes for pine wilt nematode. And, you know, talking a little bit about pine wilt in North America, I'm going to specifically talk about uh, pine wilt in Colorado as well, but it seems to be moving west. Um, it was first reported in Missouri in 1979. It's uh, moved into Kansas where uh, Dr. Tisserat worked on it, and now we have it in Colorado as well. And when we first saw it here, um, it was actually it was kind of interesting because uh, Dr. Tisserat came to Colorado State in uh, 2004, and we found the first uh, positive pine wilt disease in Fort Collins in 2006, and that was the first positive find in Colorado. And so we were teasing him that he brought it with him, and of course he denied that. <laughs> but um, but that's okay, he, he was, he's good natured about it. And he was actually the one who uh, showed me how to test for it because we had not seen it here before. And so then in, you know, after 2006, you know, we had those first finds in 2006, but we did not find anything again until 2011. And so we're not really sure what happened in those intervening years that, you know, we just couldn't find it or the samples weren't submitted to the clinic or um, things like that, you know. And now uh, in 2012, it was found in NIWAT. Um, in 2012, we confirmed a sample out of Grand Junction, which is on the western slope of Colorado. So uh, the Pine Sawyer had to cross a huge mountain range to get over there. Um, so we're not really sure how it got to Grand Junction because that's uh, pretty far west for the um, Pine Sawyer and for the for the disease for the nematode. And still, you know we've not confirmed a lot of cases. The, the number of problems of pine wilt nematode that we have um, determined with positive uh, finds is still really small considering the fact that, you know, we're testing, you know, one year, I think last year I tested maybe uh, 50 samples and I only had three positives. So again, you know, we're looking at, um, not a huge, huge problem that we're seeing in Colorado, but, you know, it, can this become an epidemic? We don't know. Um, Dr. Tisserat says, you know, speculates that because our summers are not, in Colorado, are not as warm as other parts of the country, that maybe that is limiting the um, spread of pine wilt nematode. Whether this is true or not, I don't know. Um, the fact that maybe we don't have a lot of scotch pines here in Colorado, that, um, you know, the ones that we have are, you know, pretty well cared for, so they're not under stress and attracting the pine sawyer beetles could be uh, another consideration. And, you know, <clears throat> you know there may be um, the fact that um, maybe Austrian pines are a little more resistant to the pine wilt nematode, so it's not causing a lot of problems. So again, you know, a lot of speculation out there, and you know, we test samples. In fact, I just did two samples yesterday. Uh, one was a ponderosa pine, which was negative, and the other was an Austrian pine, which was negative. So uh, again, you know, we're not seeing a lot of positives. Um, the first reports in Colorado, uh, again, in 2006 was Larimer and Weld counties up here. Uh, 2011 was uh, Denver. And then in 2012, we had a few more confirmed, but really spread out over the state. And 2012 was that Grand Junction out here in Mesa County. And so, um, but we're not seeing it really confirmed anywhere else. And so, um, 
you know, even though we get samples from uh, all over the state, um, still haven't confirmed it from uh, anywhere but, you know, like the Front Range area. And so this may, um, this chart may show uh, a little bit about um, what Dr. Tisserat was talking about was that, you know, because our temperatures were cooler in uh, the summers of 2013, 14, and 15, that we didn't see a lot of um, positive samples. So it may be that the cooler temperatures reduced the populations of the nematode. And in 2012, we actually had higher temperatures. Um, that, that was actually the warmest that we'd seen in a long time. And so that may be why we saw a lot more uh, nematode uh, activity um, in 2012 and were able to positively identify that. And uh, again, you know, the blue stain fungi is not diagnostic. It can be present, but it's not always present. And truly, the only sure diagnosis is to extract the nematodes from the wood. So, um, you know, and that's one of the things that we talk about is getting that right size sample as well. So, you know, I have people sometimes send me in like ends of branches with the needles still attached and stuff like that. And so I need, I have to call them back and uh, request the sample that's closest to the trunk area and the stem section uh, because that, that is uh, good. Or, you know, you can send me uh, chunks of the, uh, of the trunk of the tree too if uh, the tree has been cut down. You know, that's, that's always good to look at that as well. Um, some of the uh, control methods, uh, sanitation. Uh, if you have a tree that has been identified as positive for uh, the exotic pine, you know, for uh, pine wood nematode like Scotch pines or Austrians, and you cut that down, don't keep those, don't keep that wood, you know, destroy it, chip it, burn it, like that, because you just, you don't want to leave a, an incubation area for the pine sawyer to either lay eggs in and maybe pick up those nematodes again or you know you don't want the nematodes to survive. Um, limit planting of the exotic pines, that's always an option. However, probably 75% of the pines that are planted in the front range are Austrian pines. So that is, you know, can kind of be uh, an issue as well. Um, there's also uh, tree injections, um, generally like March and April or maybe October, November, although there has been, you know, I've heard some discussion about the October, November because the trees are starting to go dormant. So is uh, tree injection actually going to work and be taken up in the vascular system of the tree? So, and this is one of the things that um, Sean might uh, be able to answer more effectively uh, when he talks about the aracinate. And I'm going to actually turn it back over to Sean um, to talk about the aracinate. Um, Thank you, Dr. Blunt. Yeah, I appreciate the great right. overview and sure. the information on the biology life cycle of the, uh, the different nematodes in the pine wood uh, nematode. Yeah, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on the uh, the injection process and some of the specific management uh, strategies that we have for managing pine wilt nematode. Um, I think it's first of all important, as Dr. Blunt mentioned, you know, tree injection is only one tool in the toolbox. Um, you certainly want to use proper sanitation and uh, call out any infected trees as quickly as possible. And then it's also important to ensure that you have diagnosed pine wilt disease, especially in areas like Colorado where it isn't, there's not a high incidence of it, it's important that you have a confirmed diagnosis before we go in and start to do any um, injections on trees. Um, if we look at, I guess, the, the main way in which we can manage the nematode directly, that's through a tree injection uh, process using uh, actually an active ingredient that is more widely used by arborists and landscapers throughout the country to manage uh, mites. Uh, the active ingredient abamectin is widely used to manage both spider mites and eriophyte mites, very common mites like uh, spruce spider mite, uh, your rust mites on conifers, as well as a lot of your different spider mites on deciduous trees and shrubs. And so it's the same active ingredient as we're using on uh, those plants to manage mites. 
uh, we can use this, and research has shown that this active ingredient, abamectin, is also works quite well in preventatively treating to manage pine wilt nematode. A um, couple of key distinctions, as I mentioned, it is only effective when we're treating healthy trees or preventative treatments only. And typically, we're going to target trees. Uh, for example, if you have a windbreak of Scots pines or Austrian pines, you know that pine wilt disease is in that area. You want to target the healthy trees that um, are in close proximity that are not showing symptoms. And that's when you, uh, you want to start treating those trees that are of high value. Uh, as far as injection timing, in Dr. Tisseret's study, uh, he identified basically in Kansas that they can treat in February, in, in earliest February, March, and April. Uh, you want to treat prior to typically early May each year so that the trees are protected prior to uh, the peak flight periods of the Sawyer beetles. Um, and one treatment, the neat part about treating with uh, the product here called the Racinate, which is the trade name for the abamectin formulation that Rainbow uh, works with arborists on. The neat part about it is that you can treat every other season. So one treatment made in the spring of 2016 will last both 2016 and 2017, and then you can uh, make a repeat application then in 2018. Here is the research that was published uh, by Dr. Tisserat. Uh, I know that Dr. Blunt had referenced some of this work early in her presentation. Uh, Randy James did his master's uh, thesis project on this, and um, they were able to get a publication in the Journal of Arboriculture and Urban Forestry. And this really is the protocol for which uh, Rainbow recommends using the abamectin through a tree injection procedure. Um, it is important to note that not all tree injection uh, treatments uh, showed efficacy. Uh, the treatments uh, that Dr. Tisserat used was through a tree injection system that was developed by a Canadian uh, entomologist named Dr. Blau Helsen. It was called the STIT technique. And this was a system that he had developed uh, that allowed uh, an arborist to basically drill a series of holes in the base of the tree. Um, and it almost kind of looked like a beer bong system that you would fill up then with the abamectin, and then the product would be taken up into the pine trees, typically in less than an hour. And some of uh, the more modern day tree injection procedures and, and techniques and devices, we can fairly predictably inject uh, Scots and Austrian pines uh, in less than an hour, and in some cases even less than a half hour per tree, as long as they are healthy. Here is a good example of the aracinate uh, showing treated versus untreated. You can see the untreated tree here in the middle, uh, and the trees in the surrounding area that were treated are still protected. This serves as a great, um, I guess, photo showing the trees that you could target for treatment. And so I know that this site was a site that the arborists went on and they noticed very rapid decline of the, the pine trees here. And I'd identified that pine wilt nematode was in the area, so they went ahead and treated these other high value pines in the area to protect against uh, further uh, incidents of the disease. Here is uh, one device that was actually developed based off of Dr. Blair Helson's STIT technique and application device. This is Rainbow's pine infuser. And so this has a turn screw off cap here. Um, and you would basically measure out the aracinate um, and pour it into these tubes. And then there is, on this device, a maple syrup spile um, that you would place into the tree after you drill a hole uh, into the, the tree. Targeting, we're basically making these injections within one foot of the soil line and targeting the root flares on the tree uh, wherever possible, uh, which can sometimes be challenging on pine trees. Um, and then there's a duckbill valve you can see here that you use a, a, a pressure a syringe basically to pressurize the system and that um, basically allows for the flow of the, the aracinate into the tree. So it's a refillable micro uh, injection device, uh, one that I know is still widely used by a number of arborists um, to, to treat for pine wood nematode. We also at Rainbow have developed a new system that I would say it 
people are catching on to using for uh, Aracin as well for the pine wilt disease is our Q-Connect system. And this is a system where you pour your aracinate into the bottle here um, and you pressurize the, the tank with a standard bike pump. Um, and then there are uh, a series of injection ports, these stainless steel injection ports that you place evenly around the tree to ensure that there's even uptake and distribution of the aracinate in the tree. This is uh, a system that doesn't require any plugs. Here you can see the illustration that shows the placement of those injection ports around the pine tree. And one thing that's important when injecting pines is that you want to be very speedy. When you drill your hole, you want to set these injection ports in as quickly as possible and get the system pressurized and start the flow of the aracinate into the tree because, uh, as Dr. Blunt mentioned, these pines, especially healthy ones, will produce resin. Well, that resin, the same thing that the tree is using to ward off different insects and diseases and nematodes, um, also can make it quite challenging when doing tree injections into pine trees. And that's why, in a lot of cases, we experience longer application times when we're injecting pine trees versus some of our deciduous trees like elms and oaks. To determine the number of injection sites that you would put in the tree, basically measure the diameter of the tree and divide by two. So a 20 inch tree would have 10 injection sites. Um, and Rainbow has application guides and rate charts that would tell you how much aracinate that you would need to apply depending on the size of the tree. There you can see um, you know, another recommendation from Rainbow is to use sharp high helix drill bits. And I think that's extremely important within pines given the difficulty of injecting them. Uh, so we recommend these, these high helix drill bits when we're using the Q-Connect, and that's our standard drill bit that we recommend in general for doing tree injections. See the flow of it, how the harness system works. And so that's a, an overview, a quick overview on the use of veracinate as a tree injection treatment. Um, I will turn it back over to Dr. Blunt for her conclusion slide. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> as, yeah. as a diagnostician and as an extension specialist, I, 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 I'm not a true arborist where I get to go out and inject trees. So that's why I wanted to turn it back over to you because you know exactly what this does. I mean, I, I, I know the, the theory of it, but I, uh, I have not done it myself. So, you know, I'm more than willing to um, let, let you talk about that. But um, the prognosis, again, I, I kind of stated that at the uh, end of the um, other presentation, but, you know, like I said, about 75% of our uh, urban conifers are along the front range here in Colorado are Austrian pines. And so we're kind of keeping an eye on what is happening. Um, the Austrians, like I stated, they seem to hang on a little bit longer. Maybe they're more resistant. Um, that's one of the theories that uh, Steve Geist from Swingle has proposed is that, you know, maybe um, they're just not as susceptible as the scotch pines. So, and that may be a good thing. And again, we have had cool spring temperatures um, and a little bit cooler summers the last three years. So maybe that has slowed things down. Now, if the I saw a temperature map uh, projected off of the Weather Channel for Colorado this year, and it looks to be above average temperatures, uh, maybe even warmer than that. So um, maybe we'll start seeing more problems this year simply because uh, the temperature is going up. So we'll just keep an eye on it and see what is happening. So I don't know, we went over the one o'clock uh, deadline, so I don't know how many people are still listening, but um, if you have any questions, um, if I can answer them or Sean can answer them or Justin, yeah, think, that would be great. I think what we'll do, Tamla, I know we experienced some technical difficulties with poor Peter on the front end with his computer uh -huh. crashing and then having the microphone issues. So what we can do, um, if people want to hang on for a little bit here, you can type in any questions that you have. You can, um, and we will answer those offline. Peter can get those sent over to Dr. Blunt or myself. Okay. Um, and also feel free to send us any follow-up questions that you have. Um, certainly, 
you know, there's a lot of unknowns in managing pine wilt disease and, and uh, where it is located throughout the country. I think it is in certain parts of the country can be quite a devastating problem because uh -huh. you have these high value windbreaks that um, in a lot of cases uh, people don't know what hit them before it's too late and, and all you have as an option is removal and replacement. And so you do have some tools in your toolbox, but I think proper diagnosis is key to uh, you know, managing the problem and then using some of the techniques with sanitation and tree injection um, mm -hmm. to, to try to preserve any high value trees. So I want to thank Dr. Blunt for her time today and thank you all for attending and participating. Uh, we appreciate it. We're always open to any feedback and suggestions you have and also interested in any other ideas you have on webinar topics. Um, so thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, Tamla. Bye now. Bye-bye.